Um, hi, very glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I was going to uh, speak exclusively on my new book on Lenin, but I think uh, in the best Leninist tradition uh, that would be a wrong thing to do, because unless one discusses the present situation uh, and in, in concrete terms, um, it's, it's not going to be very interesting. But a few words about why I wrote this book on Lenin. Uh, it's, the first reason is simple. It's the centenary of the last of the three great European revolutions that transformed Europe uh, in many ways, usually and often for the better. The English Revolution of the 17th century, the uh, French Revolution of the 18th century, and the last of these revolutions, the Russian Revolution, uh, that transform not just Europe, but large tracts of the world, especially China, which you're debating tomorrow, I see. Well, China wouldn't be where it is had there not been a Chinese revolution in 1949, which completely transformed the country, uh, um, you know, which we can discuss if people are interested in question time, and was linked very directly to the Russian October of 1917. Likewise, South America, parts of South America. Uh, so the Russian Revolution, from that point of view, had the most global impact on encouraging a wave of rebellions, and it accelerated the decolonization of the world, which had been occupied by the European imperial powers for a very long time. Had there been a Russian Revolution, that process of colonization would have taken much, much longer uh, to get rid of. So why Lenin? Because he was the central uh, leader of that revolution who understood in the last stages that in order to succeed, it had to be an anti-capitalist revolution. It could not simply wait for capitalism to develop to the extent it had developed in Britain or the United States before making a revolution, <coughs> which was a more traditional view on the left, that the revolution should take place in the most advanced countries in terms of the productive forces and capital. And that was Germany, Britain and Europe or the United States across the water. And Lenin countered this with another theory. He said, this is not wrong, but we have to take advantage of the situation whenever and wherever it arises. And he formulated a sentence which really has remained true since that time, is that the capitalist chain breaks at its weakest link first. And the weakest link in Europe in that period was Tsarist Russia, autocratic, uh, where everything was dominated and controlled by the court, heavily engaged in the First World War, a, wo a, a war which disintegrated the Tsarist autocracy and subsequently the German and Viennese equivalents, though they were not exactly the same thing, and led to the fall of a number of empires. And Lenin understood that the First World War had also radicalized the peasantry, who, being on the front, the peasants in uniform, as he called them, uh, were coming back to the cities, to their garrisons, and uniting very easily and quickly with workers. Workers were a minority of the population, but not as small a minority as people might think. And it was not till the Bolsheviks got, often you hear talk, it was a coup d'etat. Well, it's just nonsense. I mean, in the elections which took place, just before October to the Constituent Assembly, the Bolsheviks got 10 million plus votes and the Peasant Party got 16 million votes, reflecting the social divisions in the country. But, uh, you know, millions of votes doesn't imply or suggest a coup in the sense of being carried out by a tiny group of people. It, what it suggests is ferment, deep ferment, 
inside the working class of the cities and they were the principal force that swept the Bolsheviks to power under the leadership of Lenin. Now, in my book, The Dilemmas of Lenin, it's got a subtitle, which is War, First World War, Terrorism, which was a huge political current in, uh, uh, in Russia, Empire, because the Tsarist Empire was beginning to break up and collapse, and it was a world of uh, empires, love, questions of sexuality, the liberation of women, um, which I uh, uh, deal with in th uh, which I, I deal with in three chapters, and then finally the revolution. What revolutions are, how they are made, and how they cannot be made. Let's discuss something which is topical now. Let's discuss terrorism. The way it is presented and portrayed today, it is linked to a religion, one religion, Islam. What is completely uh, ignored, even in terms of the current wave of terrorists, is that it has causes. And the reason that it is Islamic terrorists, or terrorists who happen to be Muslims or are inspired by their religion, is due to the fact that large tracts of the Muslim world are occupied by the United States and Western powers. The war in Afghanistan has gone on now longer than the First and Second World Wars put together. Just think about that, of the effect this has on the lives of ordinary people, on how families live, on what scares children or doesn't scare them. And don't accept this nonsense that to explain the causes of what happens justifies terrorism. I don't believe that. I have never believed it. And the Russian example in the 19th century, <clears throat> it was the century of terrorism. The Russians felt, Russian radicals, often from very upper class families, felt the only way they could bring down the autocracy, because all other routes were sealed off, was by bumping off chiefs of police, ministers of defense, and a couple of czars thrown in for variety. <coughs> and they did it. Uh, because they thought in this way they would transform Russia, there would be a mass uprising. And Lenin was very critical of this uh, theory and strategy and said the masses are not mobilized by the example of individuals in this form, that a revolution and emancipation has to be the task of those who are oppressed themselves. And these acts, however heroic they are, actually delay the process while without taking anything away from them because they never tried they never killed innocents for a start they never killed their own they never killed the poor they targeted people in high society to disintegrate the structures of czarism it didn't work they tried for 40 years it didn't work and they gave up the movement was collapsing and the European labor movement and its examples were the one that Russian revolutionaries after the terrorists turned on. So I say this to show that terrorism has long been part of the European tradition. I mean, we don't call them uh, great Orthodox Church terrorists because in fact most of them had broken with the church. Uh, and the church was, part, was the enemy for these terrorists, but you know, there was a wave of terrorism in Spain, in France, at the same time, roughly the same time, and again they targeted heads of states. Uh, I've read comments on the social media by liberals saying that Trump should be targeted in this fashion. I don't think that's a very clever idea or a good idea, but the fact that people are calling for it indicates the total despair. And interestingly enough, the fact that it's liberals who are calling for it is revealing, because Lenin said in one of his works, criticizing terrorism, he said, after all, in the last analysis, a terrorist is a liberal with a bomb. Because liberals imagine that by pressuring, lobbying, etc., you can bring about change. 
taking a bomb along with you increases the uh, intensity a bit, but the result is the same. That is not the way you're going to go forward. And today, <coughs> we can say that even uh, more emphatically, that this is not the way in which anything successful or positive or progressive will emerge. So I'm very hostile to it, but at the same time, one has to get away from the absurdity that this is somehow inherent or inbuilt in a particular religion. Most of you who know my writings know that I'm not religious. On the other hand, I hate it. I really do hate it when religions are just attacked for no rhyme or reason. You can be critical of them, you can be outside them, but to attack whole religions which are not only religions but which form an important part of culture, of the culture of the West, what would it be without Christianity? Or the culture of the Islamic world during its renaissance years in the medieval period? where the most exciting developments took place, and where, in fact, progress was made by clashes between orthodox religion and less orthodox uh, f uh, philosophers and uh, religious or semi-religious thinkers, all coming out of that same tradition. So these easy uh, sentences and words with which <coughs> ancient monotheistic religions are attacked doesn't impress me very much because it gets nowhere. All it does is create hatred. And so when you see, uh, you know, the minute the Manchester bombing, a huge tragedy takes place, the same imbeciles are there on the web. It's all the fault of this one religion. And uh, sort of people, how would one describe someone who is worse than an imbecile? <laughs> I'm trying to think of the right word, it'll come. Oh yes, Katie Hopkins. <laughs> <laughs> right, that the, we need a final solution. A final solution. As if the murder, the Judeocide of between five and six million Jews was not enough for Europe. We are embarking now in the minds of these brainless people. That's, let's repeat that again, because no one else has used the word the final solution apart from the Third Reich. And their final solution was the <coughs> extermination of European Jewry. So this language is being used again. And actually, I'll go even further. If you look at the Islamophobic attacks <clears throat> that are made, often the language that is used is not dissimilar to the language that was used in the 20s and 30s. They are not us, they are the other, they have strange customs, they wear funny things on their heads, uh, they have a different diet, etc., etc., etc. I have found during something I was researching, virtually the same rhetoric being used against the Jews. Virtually the same. So all one can say about that is that possibly the way in which the Judeocide or the Holocaust is being taught is slightly ineffective. Because if you can teach that now for 20 years as a horror beyond all horrors, and people still come out with this fascist rubbish, then something is wrong somewhere. And you know, you can pour in money and invent a hundred prevent campaigns and ask students to spy on each other and ask school teachers and professors to report to the <coughs> home office or its substitutes what people are saying to each other in class. It's not going to solve the problem because the problem isn't a problem of individuals in one country or the other, or minorities in one country or the other. The problem is the ease with which Western powers can take on a country. In this case, it so happens, mainly, though not exclusively, Muslim countries, bomb the hell out of them, and then think that there are going to be no repercussions. How can anyone believe that? British intelligence warned Blair before he went to war in Iraq, there will be a price to pay. 
if you do this. It's in the Chilcot report. You can dig it out. It's on the web. They warned. Theresa May said that she was going to make Corbyn's comments on Manchester the central issue of the campaign. Well, why didn't she? We were waiting. Why didn't she? Because the Financial Times, hardly a left-wing newspaper, published two-and-a-half-page essay pointing out that Manchester had the largest community of Libyan exiles in Britain, pointing out that the Islamist currents amongst them had been used by the British state to infiltrate back into Libya to try and topple Muammar Gaddafi, and had come back having wrecked Libya together with six months of NATO bombing between 20 and 30,000 people killed. Libya divided into three, each run by a jihadi outfit, and these kids now with nothing to do came back and were very embittered and angry. The uh, Abadi sister has said all this in an interview with the Wall Street Journal in New York. So, given that you couldn't hide the linkage now, it didn't become a central issue in the campaign. In fact, we still don't know what the central issue is in this campaign, apart from the fact that the Tories want a large majority. <laughs> I mean, that's the only central issue, is, uh, as I can see it. So, <clears throat> coming, coming to what is uh, happening here in, in the world today, and w just before I leave this subject of war and terrorism and the links between them, you know, I travel a lot in the Western world, lecturing, speaking, etc., and I am constantly amazed and I don't particularly blame people because that's how they've grown up, that's how this generation lives, that they watch all this, they know what is going on in the uh, Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, Libya, Yemen, Somalia, they know all this, they know that drones can kill people and children who have nothing to do with terrorism. The figures are quite shocking under, during the Obama regime, by the way, in particular. Quite shocking. And there's no impact. These people are almost dehumanized, the victims. Almost dehumanized. We don't know their names. We don't know who they are. And we lose interest. It's a tiny item in the press for one day, and then away it goes. And increasingly, by the way, this sort of attitude is f going to happen in, in Europe as well. You know, here there's a pattern. In Bataclan, terrorists have blown someone up. In Marseille, in Berlin. So we have the same PR slogans. I love Paris with love as a heart. I love Marseille. I love Berlin. I love Manchester. In the evening, people gather and offer solidarity. Very moving, which I would be present. Had I been in Manchester, I would have gone on the solidarity march, obviously. And then slowly it's forgotten. And the wars carry on. And no one thinks about them too closely or carefully till the next atrocity and the next outrage. And then we have the same debate all over again. So in this situation, I think it is important to think a bit of who we are, what citizenship means, why we don't have a more critical culture, why the media now has become a central pillar of the ideology of the establishment, and why democracy itself is in a state of decay. Because one of the things that the West used to boast about during the Cold War years, and with reason, we ha allow people more criticism, we allow people to elect their new governments, to chuck out old governments, it's all true. But since the decades of, since the 90s, following the years of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, and following, more importantly, the total collapse of the Soviet Union, 
and that entire world, uh, we have had a feeling on the part of even people who are not directly political in any way, but millions of people feeling there is now no alternative. There's nothing we can do. It's not that they like the Soviet Union, but its existence offered a space for them to be active, to be critical. That space went. And then we got a system of tooth and claw capitalism, which is called neoliberalism, which actually goes back to what used to exist before the Second World War, before social democratic reforms were permitted to keep the Russians and their system at bay. And this system is now, you know, in its fourth decade. And in 2008, when the Wall Street crash happened, and the rich suddenly felt nervous, you would have thought that they would have realized that something needed to be done, that all was not well, that creating this bubble and the bubble world next to it could blow up any minute. In 2008, it very nearly did blow up. And a lot of state money had to be poured in to keep these banks going. In countries which had been preaching and telling the poor in each country that they didn't have enough money to spend on them, not enough money for health, not enough money for education, not enough money to build cheap housing for young generations and the uh, new people being uh, uh, coming, into, uh, li uh, uh, coming into the job market. We don't have money to do that. But you could suddenly find three trillion to save the banks. And then why save all of them? You know, you could have saved one or two and let the others crash. But they didn't. They wanted to show that this was their system. And they were determined to keep it as it is, regardless of the fact that even mainstream economists were saying <coughs> that if you leave it like it is, just with sticking plaster on it, the blood will begin to pour through and it could happen again. And that is absolutely uh, 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 what they've done. But it has had, as the German sociologist Wolfgang Strake has been telling us now for many years, created a situation where it is having a big effect on democracy and the functioning of democracy. And the, the effect is this. I mean, a short, small book I wrote some years ago called The Extreme Center is that you have a center that exists, and I called it extreme because regardless of whether it's center left or center right, it does the same things. It makes wars at the asking of the Americans. It has no sympathy whatsoever for its poor. It cuts down on uh, public spending every single year. It privatizes the most hallowed provisions in the old uh, uh, social substructures and structures that existed after the war, everything is up for privatization. And services get worse, not better as a result, because more profits have to be made. And they did all this, and this was described in the language of neoliberalism as reforms. Oh, so and so is so backward because they don't agree with reforms. It'd be more honest to describe them as regressions. Think so and so is being really obstinate because he won't agree with us that we have to regress. But they didn't say that because with this new system, which is in fact an old system, uh, they changed the language in which in, in, in the language which people speak when describing all these things. I mean the media, but which has an effect on us. A very great German philologist who survived the Holocaust, Klemperer, wrote a book called The Language of the Third Reich, in which he showed that even on the left there were people, because they were living under the Nazi regime, began to use some of their phraseology without realizing it. And that has certainly happened with uh, neoliberalism. I've told off uh, many of my colleagues for using the word robust too much, which dates back to the Thatcher period. We shall take robust measures. I say, what is this robust? <laughs> say what you're going to do. 
So <clears throat> this language, uh, which, which has penetrated, in this language, reforms become the synonym for carrying out really backward measures, privatizing everything. And there was bound to be a rebellion against it, and this rebellion has taken different shapes and forms. In the United States, a country which I visit often, we had an amazing political insurrection known as the Bernie Sanders campaign. I mean, the meetings that took place in the United States left the official campaigns of Trump and Clinton just not knowing where to look. Tens and tens of thousands of people, not just young people, by the way, elderly people too, crowding the campaign. And to hear an American senator even use the word socialism created a frisson, because it's not been done before. And of course what he meant was social democratic reforms, and why not? But that showed that the anger in the States, the right-wing anger, was channeled via Trump, but there was another anger. And virtually every single opinion poll showed in the States at that time, virtually everyone, that had Trump been the candidate, had uh, Sanders been the cam candidate against Trump, he would have won. Now, one can't go on the basis of opinion polls, I know, but let's say he would have stood a better chance. Because the constituencies Trump got in the old industrial states, Voting was, I mean, it, the, the, the margin was very narrow. A margin that Sanders or even a candidate like Elizabeth Warren would probably have got. Instead, they went for a tried and tested corrupt politician called Hillary Clinton, who large numbers of people didn't want to support and for very good reasons. So we are now lumbered uh, <coughs> with an American president who can't, tell the difference between his posterior and his brain. I mean, you know, I'm afraid that is the case. Now, it's true, absolutely true, that there have been other dodos uh, in, the, in the Republican Party. I mean, a comparative survey of Trump with Reagan, Nixon, Bush, Bush, would be very interesting, because it's not that Nixon wasn't a racist or an anti-Semite. Trump has not yet revealed any anti-Semitic uh, leanings, if anything, the contrary. But his racism is up there for display, especially the attacks on um, people from the south, south of the United States, that is. Uh, <clears throat> Nixon, if you listen to his Watergate tapes or read the transcript, was horrific. You know, constantly referring to black people as niggers, referring to Jews, kikes, all that sort of stuff, while bombing the hell out of the Vietnamese and the Cambodians. Reagan, Reagan himself, uh, was not the world's most enlightened president. I mean, you know, I, I, it's a sad case that he had to be president because in his second term he was suffering from a mild form of dementia and didn't know which country he was in when he arrived as president of the United States. So it's not a very sort of life-enhancing catalogue, this, of US presidents uh, over the last few years. Trump, of course, being a billionaire in the bargain, doesn't need anyone else to carry these things through. And the policies they have now are very clear. The rich will get richer and the poor will have to make do. Despite all the campaign promises to do this, to build an infrastructure, not to make any more wars. And interestingly enough, the time when the liberal media relaxed was when he carried out a bombing expedition on Syria. And then everyone said, ah, oh, he's normal really because he's bombing yet another country that we're used to all our presidents doing. So at least there's some element of normality in him. Yeah, this is the state of the United States. No wonder that uh, the Europeans are panicking. Angela Merkel saying we can no longer rely on the US, we have to build our European strength. F Financial Times columnist incredibly nervous, ticking her off for saying that, but on the other hand, quite respectful that she did and saying that American power is disappearing, etc., etc. I am not one of those who believe American power is disappearing, by the way. I wish I could. 
but it's not the case, nor is American capitalism disappearing. One has to be very cold and hard-headed about this. I mean, the single most important advance of the last century, uh, which has got even greater than this one, which showed that capitalism had not lost or exhausted all its, I wouldn't use the word progressive, but all its resources. It was still there, it wasn't dead on its feet, was of course the invention of the World Wide Web, the internet on the west coast of the United States. That's where it happened. So one can't ignore that, but one has to, and one has to take it into account as understanding the soft power of the United States. Of course, the single most event, single most important event of the 21st century, I think has been the shifting of the center of the world capitalist market from the West to the East and the emergence of China, which is yet in its early stages, <coughs> has, has its own narrative and has its own story. And they've done many good things, it has to be said, in terms of lifting millions and millions out of poverty. Inequality is huge, by the way, income inequality, but nonetheless, uh, Globalization couldn't achieve that in the West. The trickle-down effect did not exist, but in China, because of the way in which they implemented these new policies, keeping heavy state control, they've succeeded to a large extent. Their problems are by no means over. They're just beginning, but that is a reality that we can't ignore. And a number of European countries and South American countries and Arab countries know this particularly well. I mean, <clears throat> a country like Pakistan, which has been a Chinese, both on the American, doing the bidding of the Americans, but at the same time close to the Chinese, now recognizes the Chinese are more important. And other countries do as well. And so this big shift of the world market in simple commodities is not too dissimilar to Britain's triumphal entry into the world after the Industrial Revolution. Of course, one has to take into account and bear in mind that all the advanced technology in virtually every field is still being produced in either the United States or Germany. That's uh, without, you know, there's no doubt about that. But the rest, which is giving China this huge base, is being produced largely, not exclusively in China, but if you add the uh, South Korea, uh, Singapore, Japan, to the Far Eastern sphere, it's huge, absolutely huge now, the market, <clears throat> and can't be ignored. That will at some stage have an impact on US hegemony and power in the world. But till now, uh, it hasn't. The US is the militarily the single most important power in the world. What it can't achieve by guile, it achieves through wars, through violence, as capitalism always has done. And the one thing which people often forget that Karl Marx used to write is that the effect of capitalism and its, its cataclysmic side is <clears throat> it not simply reduces its victim to the status of commodities. Here he was talking, of, of course, about the workforce, but he says it actually destroys any humanity that might have been left in a capitalist. And he said capitalism also destroys the individual in individual capitalists. They become devoid of humanity. And I think we know this from numerous examples. Today, but not just today, over the last years, in the United States uh, and in Europe, where it's perfectly, actually, if you even think about it rationally, it is not in their immediate interest, but it is in their medium and long-term interest to create a different world. From their own point of view, but they won't do it. Because the competition and the desire for profits is so huge 
that it dominates everything. So politics is very similar. You have a center and you have the, an extreme right to the right of that center and various contending groups to the left of the extreme center. Usually it's the right that is more powerful because the left is, uh, has either disappeared <coughs> or is weak. The one exception is the French election campaign recently where Jean-Luc Mélenchon uh, got 19 point something percent of the vote, which was huge for a candidate of the left, really huge. And had the rest of the left voted for him in the first round, the final campaign would have been not the fascist or proto-fascist Le Pen versus Macron, so the French establishment could scare everyone into voting for a banker, a literally a banker, uh, who now wants to bomb Syria, so he's a banker bomber. They've at last got a person who's both things at the same time. So, <clears throat> um, had the left behaved more intelligently and Mélenchon had been the candidate against Macron, it would have been a totally different campaign. And it would have radicalized many more people. So this volatility uh, is still there and there is a lot to fight for. And that brings me to the situation in this country. That Jeremy Corbyn, an old friend of mine, I've known him for 40 years, we've shared platforms on virtually every subject under the sun together, is suddenly elected leader of the Labour Party. Why? Why? Because the Labour Party bureaucracy and the old Blair leadership and the Brown leadership thought that one way of keeping the left at bay was to open up the voting to, to people who want to register to vote for a leader uh, who may not be members of the Labour Party or the trades unions but who could register or supporters of the Labour Party and half a million people joined. It's an astonishing figure. It's less now because some have left, got fed up with the constant carping and attacks on Corbyn, but they did join. And that made Labour the largest political party in Europe suddenly. And this was largely due to what? To Corbyn going on television with hardly a hope in winning, but they had to have him on because he was a candidate. And people heard him saying things like, I believe in free higher education. And he told me, he said, I was at one big meeting and I said, if I'm elected as leader and we ever have a Labour government, which I hope we do, I one thing I want to promise you, there will be free higher education so working class and poor kids have the same facilities to go to universities and don't have to go around raising money. And he said what shook him was the large numbers of young people who came up to talk to him afterwards and said, was that once the case? When was this true? They had no idea that once upon a time, not so long ago, not only was higher education free, but if you couldn't afford to pay the small fees that there was, the state paid it for you in the, in, in, in the form of state grant. And this campaign promise has led lots of large, large numbers of people, lots of young people, to register, to vote. So we will see, it's not all over. I'm not too optimistic, but the campaign in its last days uh, has seen, you know, Corbyn doing rather well. And despite the attacks of the media, when someone like David Dimbleby can say that he's extremely worried that the media has shown such bias against Corbyn, you have to take up, you have to stand up and take notice of what Dimbleby is saying because he's so far, he's been part of the problem, so I'm glad he's realized it. Now this constant bias, whether it's the BBC's sort of Laura, whatever her name is, or whether it's someone else, or whether it's the Guardian columnists pouring their bile onto Corbyn day in, week in and week out. Everyone, and <clears throat> I mean, it'd be a miracle if he pulled it off, but he's getting closer. 
And that's because people are tired and fed up of the same rotten old politics with politicians from both the center parties or the all three center parties coming up with the same style of rubbish. So my advice is, I mean, I will certainly be voting Labour for the first time in many years because I stopped voting Labour during the Blair years. Just never did it. Uh, or the brown years. Uh, for the first time since 97, that was the last time I voted Labour, I will be voting Labour, even though I'm in a safe Labour constituency, just to raise the popular vote. And it's obviously based on the promises made in the manifesto, which has turned things around. The promise to take the railways back into public ownership, supported by between 50 and 60 percent of the British population for three decades. At last, a politician is saying it will be implemented. And why shouldn't it be? Because the privatized railways are still subsidized by the government. So why shouldn't they have their own? On the health service, I mean, I have certainly advised this. and. It should, I mean, I um, hope it's campaigned for, is, you know, it is not, it's not possible just to finance everything by raising taxes. The state actually has to own something profitable. And one of the big mistakes made with the NHS, the National Health Service, when it was set up in 1945, one of the big mistakes was not to create a state pharmaceutical industry which could produce cheap medicines that could be sold all over the world. It would have benefited the whole world, not just Britain. And that still can be done. Cuba does it, Brazil does it to a certain extent, India does it, many other countries do it of differing ideologies. Here, difficult to do because they'd say the World Trade Organization will move in. Well, let them. Let Parliament vote it through and do it. We'll see which international organization uh, <coughs> um, can stop it. And on education, I mean, it's absolutely obvious that the private schools have to lose all the advantages they've been given by the state in terms of taxation and being given charity status. This is another mistake aptly made in 45, and the Labour government of Harold Wilson in 64 with Anthony Crossland as the education secretary at one stage was thinking of doing it, I wish they had done it, of removing this charitable status, thus privileging private education. They can have their private schools if they want, but no state allowed privileges, because that would be permitted, had these schools been taxed, to create a much better, higher level state education system, which is then attacked for not doing its best because it's being starved of money and all these wretched academies are coming into being. Quite a few of them, I notice, collapse every one or two years because someone's run off with the funds provided by the state because the academy style is a better style. So this is the world we confront, and especially young people, your generation. You know, I'm not one of those who thinks, so oh, every generation should be like the 60s or 70s. It's just rubbish. Every generation is its own. Every generation is formed by the dominant culture and ideology under which it lives. And one of the things that this new generations are being encouraged to do is not to think. You know, the old MTV slogan, don't worry, be happy. Well, it's very difficult to be happy in these circumstances, given what's going on. And the great German philosopher Ernst Bloch said that there are two different ways of dealing with crises and dealing with defeats. One is, of course, to despair, and he advised people, don't despair because it's a passive emotion. Despair leads to total passivity. The only emotion, even in bad times, is hope, and that leads to activity. So one shouldn't give up however bad the period is, however grim th things seem, but to remain active as best one can and be critical. Think for yourselves. You know, don't take for granted anything that is offered on a platter from above. It usually uh, never works. And slowly and surely, at some stage in this 21st century, there will be, I'm convinced of that, a wave of uprisings, 
small, large, successful, unsuccessful, who knows, trying to fight for a better world. I mean, that is something which large numbers of radicals share in common over the centuries. Regardless even, I, I will say this, of what their ideologies were. The English revolutionaries based their work on God, on Puritanism. Very radical, nonetheless. That's what they did it. Robespierre believed in virtue and reason. The Bolsheviks believed in internationalism, creating a whole world which was very different so that capital would be buried for once and for all. None of these things have been achieved. Liberty, equality, fraternity have not been achieved. Leave alone in, in, in the world, not in France either. Hence you see a lot of uh, uprisings in the banlieues. So it takes time and, and the, the, the history of the world is littered with defeats and periods of defeats. But at times these change and new possibilities emerge. But unless you know how to think critically, you can't take advantage of them. And that's also, returning to Lenin, something he was capable of doing, even though in a total minority, sometimes a minority of one. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for that uh, very interesting address. Uh, so we don't eat into the Q&A time too much. We'll go straight to the audience Q&A because it's uh, already nine o'clock, actually. So uh, please keep questions brief. Um, if you are selected, wait for the microphone to reach you before asking your question. The microphone will record you, but it will not amplify you. So please do project um, to whoever you want. I'm sorry, I kept looking at that clock thinking that was the time. <laughs> and, and wondering how, why was I was speaking so slowly yeah. today, but, but you're right. Yeah, uh, let's go to the, the gentleman on the R. I'll see over there halfway through. <laughs> Don't worry. No, I'm really sorry. The Tories called this general election largely as a cynical grab for parliamentary domination. Nevertheless, do you think it presents a genuine opportunity for the left? Yes, because if you have a Corbyn victory, um, I think there will be changes in this country. I mean, even the three big things that they have uh, advertised, the top of their thing, free higher education, taking the railways back, more money for creating cheap homes for first time uh, buyers or people who want to rent accommodation, that on its own would be a, a small step forward. So yes, it's not that he's offering revolution or anything like that, it'd be completely unrealistic, but genuine reforms are being offered. Uh, so they didn't want this to be the case, but his campaigns, especially in the northern parts of the country, if you watch them, what is happening in this campaign is that Tens of thousands of people are coming out to listen to him. And that way of fighting general elections had more or less disappeared. So, yes. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, okay, sure. We can go to the, uh, the um, other hand further back there, yeah. What would Lenin have made of the narcissistic psychopath that was Stalin and his massive leap forward, which killed millions of his own people and, well, created the Cold War, basically? What would because obviously Lenin died before Stalin took power. Well, okay, I get. Well, he was already in the last two years of his life. I mean, the last chapters of my book are about his last two years, watching what was happening and becoming more and more upset, writing articles, critical of what was going on, demanding innovations and change. In his last will and testament, he said Stalin should immediately be removed as general secretary of the party. He's unfit and unsuitable for the post. So it's very obvious, had he lived another five years, who knows what exactly would have happened, but what happened under Stalin wouldn't have happened. On that, right-wing historians, conservative historians, and I agree, I mean, Robert Service, Pipes, they say that, that he was of a very different, made cut from a very different cloth, and the history of the Soviet Union would have been different. Okay, 
Great. Um, let's go to the hand there at the very end of the row next to the bookcase. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm from the Netherlands, and in our last elections, our Green Party actually won a lot of seats, and a lot of people are very positive about that because they are able to um, advocate towards like young people, but also higher educated people. But what you see is that they took a lot of seats from our Labour Party, which was like totally smashed away, and that we now do not have a party anymore that has like an organized way of, for example, negotiating with the trade unions, but also with right-wing parties, and our negotiations are really not coming from the ground. Do you think um, the cost of having a flexible movement on the left um, is too high on like, organized left parties that are actually working for the working class in an organized way? <coughs> in Britain? Well, I think in general. Well, in general, in France, we've had a very good experience of a new movement being created, utilizing all the facilities of the internet and the social networks, and winning 19.5 or 6 million votes. It's a huge leap uh, in that. And then using all the technology which exists. When Mélenchon was invited to speak at four different places at the same time, but he had to do the meeting in Paris, Four holograms of him were created so the speech could be heard in meeting halls elsewhere, which people liked. So one has to think creatively. What I think is a problem is that the, some of the groups on the left are too stuck in the ways which really date back now to the 20s and 30s of the last century. So the ideas have to be renewed and renovated, but so has the way in which people think of uh, activism and creating new political movements and new political parties. And there are lots and lots of uh, examples, you know, the Bolivian example, the Ecuadorian example, the early Venezuelan example of huge social movements, creating political parties, mingling with them and winning electoral victories. So. It's a question of who is there, who is capable of doing it. Like in the United States, after Sanders was, you know, for whatever reason, there's a debate, as you know, didn't become the nominee of the Democrats, there was a lot of debate, should we create a third party? But in the US, as in Britain, the electoral system itself is so skewed and so undemocratic that third parties normally don't do well. So in times of elections, people gather to parties they know. It's been tribal. This has been broken in Scotland with the emergence of the SNP, partially in Wales. But Corbyn has now revived the idea of, of, of something new politically, though not organizationally. And that he needs to pay, and others need to pay some attention to. But I think there is a possibility. And look, if you don't, if if the left doesn't do this, people vote for the right because the right is stealing a lot of the ideas from the left. I mean, Le Pen's campaign. I mean, it's quite horrific. This, but she made a lot of points about the collapse of the French social state. She said, "We will stop the privatizations. We will create jobs. We will build, have state industries." Totally the opposite of what her father was saying uh, when he was the candidate. He was totally for Maastricht, totally for Europe, totally hostile to state intervention. So even the, the people on the right are beginning to change. And I think the left has a lot of strong ideas. It's the translation of those ideas into practice which remains a problem. Thank you. We've got time for a few more questions. Um, let's go to the hand here, second along. I wonder whether you... Oh, can you just wait for the microphone, please? I wonder whether you could please say a few words about what happened in 1968. I, I was a student then. I was walking behind you, Rudy Duchke, Henri Cohn-Bend, in Paris and in London. Why is it that time the students' agitation was so strong? Nowadays, students don't care a damn, really, about what's happening in the politics. But you really cared. What has happened? What happened then? Well, you know, <clears throat> I, I, as I said in my talk, each generation is different. I could take you back, you know, before 68. Why is it that in the 1930s, most of the students 
or let's say, a large majority of students in German universities were fascists. Ma even before Hitler came to power, he'd won the universities. Uh, so this idea that students somehow have a special class category and are always meant to be radical is deeply flawed and wrong. It happened in 68 for a variety of reasons. One was <coughs> a massive expansion in university, um, um, in the number of students universities took, big expansion of the universities, bad conditions in most of these universities, a war being fought in Asia, the Vietnam War, uh, which was heroic by the, a poor peasant country against the world's largest, mightiest imperial power. Uh, and a feeling that things couldn't carry on like this in terms of sexuality. I mean, when I came to this university in 63, homosexuality was prohibited. Think about that. So one of the gains of 68, the sexual liberation movements, <coughs> the women's liberation movement, the gay liberation movement, were called liberation movements in alignment with the national liberation movement of Vietnam which was fighting for similar causes. So people linked it compared to the identity politics of today, which is largely identity and you know, quite apolitical. It was a very different way in which these movements began. And that is because uh, times were different and defeats were suffered. Uh, there were you know, lots of uh, repercussions of that. And then, as I, uh, as I attempted to uh, explain, um, the victory of Thatcher and Reagan in turning the clock back began, and it was difficult for students not to be uh, affected by this, because they're always a transitional layer. They're not a permanent layer. The, uh, they change, they, they're at a university for three years or a bit longer in some places, and then they go off, and then a new intake comes in. So it will always be different. Okay, great. We've got time for just, I think, one more question now. Let's go across the aisle here. Some sitting there. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Sring Dolma. Uh, I came from India. I'm Tibetan. Uh, I want to ask Mr. Tariq Ali. Uh, you said that uh, China being a capitali capitalist, they, have did, they are doing good to uplift general public. My question to you is that, uh, what is your view that China is doing to uplift uh, rural Tibetans in Tibet? Well, my views on Tibet and China are virtually the same as my views on India and Kashmir. I think <coughs> both these large Asian states have terrible records in relation to their minorities, national minorities in uh, particular. And I have long been a believer in giving maximum autonomy, uh, if not independence, to these uh, different uh, areas in Asia. And there, India and China are not the only ones. So that's my position and uh, uh, as someone involved with the New Left Review and uh, Versa, we publish lots of texts on these questions. So our position is, is, is quite clear on that. The thing is, if they're not going to do it, it doesn't seem, despite the, the movements. But my, uh, no, my, my present question is that, uh, what is Chinese government it do, is doing to uplift Rural Tibetans, because uh, as far as what I know, I have come to know that there's no hospitals, proper hospitals in rural uh, Tibet, and also uh, their uh, economic condition is very uh, not in a good state. So uh, do you have any ideas or views upon this? Yeah, I've just told you, I agree with you. I mean, what I said <coughs> was that if Tibet were granted its autonomy, a lot of changes would take place for the better. Though I, I must say from what I've read recently in uh, relation to Tibet is that what they're doing is, uh, is getting large numbers of people from the dominant nationality, the Hans, to move into Tibet. That is the way they're dealing with that problem. And once that is done, 
I have absolutely no doubt. I'm not saying I support it. I'm just sort of pointing out a fact that they will build the schools and hospitals for their own nationality, if none other. Thank you. OK, um, unfortunately, that's um, all we've got time for today. Um, sorry that we didn't have time for as many questions as we hoped for, but thank you very much for coming here this evening and sharing some of your thoughts with us. Um, please join me in thanking Tarek Ali for coming to speak tonight. <laughs>